Good. Love you, Pastor Anthony. Come on. If you got your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. Going to have ourselves a little bit of a Bible study. And then uh, just watch this Holy Spirit just does some crazy cool stuff, yeah? De- declare this with me. I will not be dominated by anything. I will not be dominated by anything. If you're in agreement with that, give Jesus some praise this morning. All right. There is um, a battle for the programming of a generation. It's not just beginning right now. It's been happening for generations. But we're seeing things hatch right now in, in the present. We're seeing things harvested right now, things that were harvested generations prior. To a great degree, the church is trying to um, catch up a bit. Um, and to a great degree, we're saying, um, oh my, how do we interrupt some of the dysfunctional patterns that we're already seeing across the culture, especially uh, within, within, within the church? I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about some stuff today that's not necessarily going to be uh, the most popular. Uh, in fact, um, uh, that's the problem with teaching the Bible. That's the problem. We're going through the book of Corinthians, <laughs> chapter by chapter, um, verse by verse. The problem with doing that, I mean, I would much rather give you uh, three keys to be more successful in business. <laughs> um, but I, the problem with preaching the Bible is that it makes you talk about things uh, that aren't necessarily all that popular um, within, within, within the culture. So our commitment with studying the book of 1 Corinthians is that we're going to go through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I can promise you this. I'm not going to skip a verse just because it could make me unpopular. I don't have to apologize for anything. If the Bible says it, I'll just repeat it. The Bible says it, we'll believe it. We're going to teach what the Bible says. It's kind of funny. We, um, we were doing this series and, 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 we were, and we had to talk about God's plan for sexuality. And, um, and I guess I made the statement that uh, sexuality, biblically, is between a man and a woman. And when I said that... Um, uh, somebody online was like, wow, it, it's been forever since I've actually heard a pastor say that. And so they wrote a check to the church with a letter saying, we are sowing into Seattle Bible, they're not from the state here, they said, we're sowing <laughs> a seed into Seattle Bible Center as a thank you just for um, declaring what the Bible says. <laughs> The battle is not against the globalist. The battle is not against the communist. The battle is not against the socialist. The battle is not against the Democrats. The battle is not against Republicans. The battle is not against Donald Trump. The, the, ba- the battle is not against um, uh, Joe Biden. Um, but there is, there is a, a battle, and there's manifestations of, of, of this battle, and there are people that are partnering with various aspects of, of, this, of this battle. And we have to realize that it, it is a battle for life. It is a battle all about life. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you would have and... So there are two agendas. There's a life agenda, and then there is an anti-life um, agenda. And the only way to have life is you have to have a male and a female. You have to have the seed, and you have to have an egg. And there has to be consummation between the egg and the seed. There has to be... Um, this place where there is a intermingling of souls. And this is what sex is. And I just said that word at church. I, I, okay, I, now let me, let me just... <laughs> let me just do this real quick. There are some within the church 
that would use this term almost in a shock and awe way to even build the church. There used to be, when I was in uh, seminary, there was, there was a joke that I would hear pastors use. If you want to double the size of your church, do a sex series. <laughs> and I was like, is, that, is it that easy? <laughs> All right, let's do it. Um, and, and then there's also, kind of with that religious spirit, that place where we're even terrified to even kind of say, say, say the word. So there's this place of just very liberally overdoing it, shock and awe, which I believe is, is grievous, uh, is very grievous, um, grievous, something like that, um, to, the Holy, to the Holy Spirit, because it's, it's using something that he created as worship, as a marketing tool. How is doing a sex series in church to grow your church any different than using Britney Spears to sell Coca-Cola? So God has created, within the confines of covenant marriage, this place where there can be the intermingling and connection of souls, this participation and this incredible divine union of the mind, the will, and the emotions, the body, the chemicals of the body, in order to come together in this process of becoming one flesh. For his worship, for his glorification, for life, for procreation, for pleasure in Christ Jesus. A beautiful, holy gift. And then you have, warring against this worship, a philosophy that says it is merely just natural. The effect of humans that are in essence just another animal like any other animal that has a natural drive, that you have within you a certain programming and that it is your freedom to deny the science and to identify with whatever feels natural and normal and whatever particular age you are in. It used to be that in school you would go through a biology class um, and now things that should be taught in biology class are being taught more in psychology class and there is an anti-life programming that now is um, mandated on a state level to begin in kindergarten with the propagating of what I would consider an anti-life, anti-Christ ideology that would begin in kindergarten where what should be taught to children from a mommy and a daddy is now being taught by textbooks that are radically um, perverse, that are Babylonian in their DNA. And it's nothing new. It has come to a climax within our culture where the church is finally saying, whoa, wait, wait, what, what? Uh, the radical change that we need, it won't be able to be legislated. We're far past that. The only hope for our country is Jesus. The only hope for our country is that the bride of Christ, that we would awaken to who we are and what God has called for us to do. God has arranged. He has planned. A third great awakening. There is going to be a harvest of souls, a harvest of righteousness, and a fire of God that begins to spread across our country. There is going to be a there is going to be a great reformation that takes place. Our sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Our, our grandmas and grandpas are going to dream dreams. Signs, wonders, and miracles are going to take place. We're going to cast out demons and take down principalities and powers and establish a godly banner over our region, cities, and neighborhoods. The banner of the standard, the banner of Jesus the Christ. What we're facing right now is nothing new. These principalities are, are ancient. And it's so important that we are not intimidated and that we are not bully, but that you find your voice, that you get comfortable with sharing and standing, that you get comfortable with leaning into the resistance. I love what Michelle said, without justice, there cannot be peace. 
So I cannot entangle with the spirit of apathy and lethargy that would say, Pastor Darren, as long as you are silent, you're keeping the peace. That is not kingdom. That is cowardly. When we begin to dive in, Paul's going to say some stuff. And, and I'm so glad because in just a second here, Paul's going to take over and I can decrease so that Paul may increase. So, uh, <laughs> Paul, he's going to say some things way better than I ever will, you know. I'll start talking, my eyes will start twitching, Darren will get all tricked out by his own words and stuff. So I'll just, we'll read, we'll read the word and stuff. But as we, as we dive into the infallible, unchangeable, inspired word of God, it is this authority by which we stand and live and move. It gives, it's our, it's our plumb line. All right, as we dive into this, if there's something in your soul that wants you to hang your head where you feel like you can't make eye contact with me, I want you to pay real close attention to that. Why? Because the enemy comes to bring accusation to get you to entangle with shame so that you would feel like you're disqualified because of your past. That's a religious spirit. It's a lying spirit that is not of the Holy Spirit. So if at any moment in time you begin to be condemned because of your past sins, I want you to unengage with that spirit of condemnation. And I want you to say condemnation. Let's try it together. Condemnation. Shame. You are a demon. And you are not for me. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Therefore, I can lift my head up high and look high. To the Word. All right. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. All right, Paul's going to, how many of you have ever known someone that they use quotations all the time? You know, my favorite Siren Night Live skit, you know, I think it's Chris Farley. I'm sorry, I don't wear deodorant, right? Like, that, that, that's the way that, uh, that Paul begins. He, he uses all these quotations. Why? Um, Paul is going to begin pulling out these catchphrases, these uh, Corinthian catchphrases that Christians are, um, are using. Why? Because in the church in Corinth, um, there is a culture where sexuality is just whatever's natural, what, whatever whatever you crave, whatever you desire. Okay, then you go ahead and you go ahead and engage with that. Okay, and so this is what's going on. And I want you to do this as we're reading this. I want you to think about if you were Paul, if you were writing a letter to Christians in Corinth, and you had all these believers that in the area of sexuality they let down all their standards. And in fact, so much so that you know how many of you like when you get hung. <laughs> This is funny. All right. <laughs> I mean, like, when you get hungry, this is like confessing that you're a smoker. But how many of you, when you get hungry, you go to McDonald's? <laughs> right. All right. I see that hand. Good. God bless you. All right. Isn't that funny when McDonald's is, like, worse than, all right. Um, <laughs> that I would never, never go to McDonald's. All right. All right. So for the Corinthian church, it's like, um, if you're hungry, you go to McDonald's. And if, you're, and if you're craving something sexual, you go to a prostitute. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if you're, if you're hungry, you have a burger. If you're, if you're sexually turned on, you just go find, find a prostitute. And there would be nothing wrong with that. That was a, a very common practice within the church. And so I want you to think about Paul. Like how, do you, how do you do that? How do you write this letter? Okay. And so he's going to use a phrase that they're using. Look at the very first phrase that they're saying is, all things are lawful for me. So Paul brings it up. All things are lawful for me. And then he responds, but not all things are helpful. Amen. And then he, he says it again. He says, all things are lawful for me. He goes, check it out. But I will not be dominated by anything. This is what Paul says. He says, get away from me with all your catchy Christian cliches. You have a catchy cultural saying to justify every inch of your compromise. 
Your liberty has become your liability. You have traded your wisdom for secular hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure outside of Christ. And for the record, okay, I would consider myself a Christian hedonist. What is that? It's the pursuit of pleasure inside of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? You're like, can you give me an example? I would love to. So <laughs> on Saturday, which is my Saturday, I call it Saturday, um, I have been known to have myself what I call a glory bar from Chuck's Donuts. Now, a glory bar is a, is a maple bar from heaven. And angels actually make the maple bars. And when you, when you eat them, you become wonderfully and gloriously intoxicated in the Holy Spirit. And so, like on Saturday morning, I'll have a bite of that, of that glory bar. And you can even talk to my children. When I, when I receive it, I receive it with thanks. I do, out loud. And I'll just be like, thank you, Jesus. For this maple bar, and I'll receive it with gladness. Listen, anything that you can receive with gladness of heart, anything that, that, that you feel like you can, you can engage with, with Jesus, that is wonderful and good. But anything that we are engaging with, where we actually have to tell Jesus um, to go into the other room so that we can engage with it. That is a violation of our relationship, a violation of our freedom, a violation of our liberty. And this is what Paul is talking about. Verse 13, Paul says, look, at, here's another um, quote, okay? Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. This is what they're saying. In the same way that I get hungry and I eat, when I am feeling sexual, I would engage in the same way. What does Paul respond with? All right, so food is meant for the stomach, stomach for food. God responds with, yeah, and God will destroy both of them. He's in a good mood, too. And this is what he says, yeah. Like, Paul, like, yeah, and God was going to destroy it. Right. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. The body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Verse 14. And God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. This is what Paul is saying. It's not just natural, it's supernatural. You're saying, you're explaining away your sexuality, saying, this is just natural. I get hungry and I eat. This is what Paul's saying. Your sexuality is not just natural. Natural it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's natural. You can teach this in biology. You can look at the science of, of the way that God has created us. Absolutely. But it's not just natural. It is also Supernatural. And he'll explain, look at this, verse 15. He'll explain, he said, do you not know or have you already forgotten that your bodies are members of Christ? Verse 16, uh, uh, and he continues, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. This is what Paul says. To dishonor your body is to dishonor Jesus. To dishonor your body is to dishonor the body of Christ. Your body is created within the context of love and covenant to produce life, to reproduce. Why? Because love, it creates. And so therefore, your body, this life given, created in the image and likeness of Jesus, also the parallel that we'll be talking about more in the future, that the very church is called the body of Christ. This is what he's saying. To dishonor your body is to dishonor Jesus in his body. Now, many of us, when we look in the mirror in the morning, we find ourselves saying some dishonorable things about our bodies. Why? Well, maybe the programming associated with this world says that when you compare your body to the body of this celebrity or this sports star, that 
you're disgusting. That your stomach is disgusting. That your face is disgusting. That you should be ashamed of yourself. And so what do we do? It's interesting. We go to the grocery store and you got, again, magazines, which... Who buys them? I swear, I've never seen one person actually take one of those magazines off the rack and purchase it. I've never seen that. I've never seen somebody like, oh, that's interesting. You know, the real life of JFK. Like, I'm going to buy that. Like, no. Like, nobody cares. Like, why is that there? I don't know. But again, they still have magazine racks at grocery stores, even though nobody buys them. And you've got all these people, and, and, and they've got these bodies that, for honest, you and I don't have, except for maybe one or two people in the entire church. And, um, you know, and they're saying... If you want this body, then read this magazine so that we can shame you into the change that you need to transform yourself. Shame is not a good motivator. And here's what we do. We take these magazines, we watch these TV shows, we see these apps, we subscribe to this worldly program. Again, that is what anti-life. And what do we do? We begin to shame ourselves, saying very nasty things about ourselves and about our body And when you shame your body, you are shaming the body of Christ. That when you dishonor your own body, you are dishonoring the church. When you hurt your body, you are hurting the body of Christ. But when you bless your body, you are blessing the body of Christ. What happens when you curse something? You stifle the life and the potential within it. What happens when you bless something? You bless the life and the potential within the seed. What happens when we curse ourselves? What happens when we curse our soul? What happens when we say things like, I'm emotionally unstable? Or, I'm a nervous wreck? What happens when we say things like, I'm so depressed right now? Or, I hate myself because I can't fit in when we do these things when we come into agreement with these lies we are coming in agreement with a curse that's coming to stifle to strangle and to keep us from producing life and life abundantly the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy and he'll do that by attacking our mind he'll do that to enter into every gate in order to get to your soul. Because every battle is a battle for your soul. Every battle you face is a battle for your soul. A battle for your mind, your will, and your emotions. And the way that the enemy is coming after our soul is through the eye gates, through the ear gates. This is why when we start talking about sexual freedom, people hang their head down and they don't want to look. Why? Because in the same way that bondage came to the eye gate, liberty also comes to the eye gate. In the same way that bondage comes to the ear gate, freedom also comes to the ear gate. The enemy uses the same gates as the Holy Spirit. You become like that which you uphold. So if you uphold hustler.com, you are going to become that which you watch. So all of a sudden, there will become a progression of one behavior to the next behavior to all of a sudden, you will be thinking like a predator. Men viewing women as the prey. And now you have men that should be product, uh, protectors posturing themselves as seducers. And the same would be true for women. The same would be true of, there's this new TV show, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's called The The Bachelor. I, I, you know, I haven't actually, but what you have is you have all these women that (laughs) try to seduce this poor man. (laughs) This poor guy, he's the victim in it, you know. (laughs) And you got this guy, they're all just trying to like, shouldn't we make out now? He's like, okay, you know. It's just like, how is this still a show, right? Like, it should be called Prostitutes or something. Like, it's like, right, like, like, let's make out for five minutes and see, like, if you like me. Where were we? All right, ver- verse 15. Oh, yeah, I, I remember. It's a, it's, it's, a battle. it's a battle for the soul. Now, as we're talking, for, for some of us that are in this, like, 
place of like temptation and stuff sexually, like there's going to be some, some keys for freedom here. But I just want you to think about this. That the, 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 the sexual struggle is just a small little part of the struggle when it comes to actually the soul. Because what we're actually talking about is not giving ourselves to prostitutes. You know, uh, with a crowd of this size, it might be three or four. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hopefully not. But um, with a crowd of the, you know, we're not really ultimately talking about giving ourselves to prostitutes. What we're talking about is giving our soul to any idol by offering up our soul to any stronghold that would come as a counterfeit papa to say, I will give you the affection that you want. But actually what we're giving ourselves to is a tyrannical master who wants us as a slave and doesn't just want us, but he wants our, our seed line and our offspring. Yeah? Okay. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So then I take the members of Christ and I make them members of a prostitute? Never. That's a good response. Never. Verse 16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Just to clarify right now, I will not share myself. Yeah. From this point forward, I will not share myself. This is... This is my body, this is his body, and I'm going to protect what the Lord has given to me. And the only person I give myself to is my Lord Jesus Christ in that place of covenant and to my spouse in that place of covenant. Yeah? You see, in this place of handing over our soul, counterfeit affections, giving our, our soul over to things that give us temporary peace. And this place of what we're talking about is not just adultery, but idolatry. And the worship of good things or bad things that become God things. That what we're doing is we're sleeping with other partners and then coming back to Jesus. And this is what Paul says. Don't you dare try to give Jesus some sort of spiritual STD. He has pledged a monogamous commitment to you. He said he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he expects nothing less from you and I. That when we say, Jesus, it is to you that I give myself wholly, completely, with devotion. That Jesus, when you reveal something to me, I'm going to take it seriously. That Jesus, in 2021, I declare... I will not be dominated by anything. And guess what? Grace says you don't have to be. You see, religion says you can't really be free. You can't really be free of perversion. You can't really be free of addiction. So all, all you can do is kind of like modify your behaviors. You know, I, I was told bad things by good people when I was a child. This is just the way that it is. This is normal. This is healthy. And so what we do is we modify our behaviors in order just to deal with it. Don't modify your behaviors to deal with the demon. <laughs> then what do you do? You don't deal with your behaviors you deal with the demon. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. It's the mystery of one flesh. The two shall become one. And that's not a metaphor. That is literal. That is Pastor Greg's brother who goes to a conference. His wife doesn't get to go. And she says, darn it, God, in your word it says that the two shall become one flesh. And if he's at that conference, I want to go. And then she goes up into a trance and then attends the conference in a trance. Bill Johnson has an entire message on the power or the anointing of the tribe and how one person can receive an impartation. And that impartation comes to the entire tribe. 
In the same way that a little bit of leaven can contaminate the, the entire group, a little bit of righteousness can go a long, long way. Paul would say, I have the mind of Christ. Well, of course you do, Paul. Why? Because you've lifted up your soul to Christ. You have intermingled. You allowed your soul to mingle. So we know that, that sex is the mingling of souls, but it's just a parallel for what's taking place in the spirit that when you come into covenant, into this incredible, glorious, pure blood covenant with Christ Jesus that we celebrate when we receive communion in his body that was broken in his blood, that was shed, that we declare these realities over my life. So Paul says, I have the mind of Christ. What's he saying? He says, I have the mind. I have the will, I have the emotional fortitude of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because we are one. So next time you're about to go out of control, the next time you're, you're, you're about to act like the, the 2020 version of you, just declare, I have fortitude of soul. I have self-control. Why? I am one with Christ. And what I am lacking in the flesh, I possess through my union with him. Grace doesn't just say, it's okay when you mess up. Grace comes to fuel you with the endurance and the fortitude that you need to choose not to sin. You are powerful to choose not to to sin. I don't have to do that. Why? I set my will that is in alignment with the will of the with the will of Christ Jesus. I am my will is in alignment with his will. Therefore, I exercise my will right now, and I'm going to say this big powerful word. Satan, no. I can't just cast a demon out every time you're tempted. No. That's it. That's the word. Let's try it together. No. One, two, three. No. Isn't that good? Yes. You can say yes. That when the enemy comes, you just say no. What do we do? When the enemy comes, what do we do? Verse 18, this is what he's going to say. Flee from sexual immorality. This word uh, Im immorality is the word pornea, okay, which is where the word pornography comes from, porn. But it's not just pornea isn't just porn. It's anything sexual outside of covenant union with Christ, okay? So when pornea, okay, which is a demon, when sexual immorality, which is a demon, comes for you, what do you do? You flee it. You escape it. You don't make it tea. You don't bargain with it. What? We do not negotiate with terrorists, <laughs> right? Like a little Bin Laden knocks at your door and, well, let's just talk for a second. No. So get the hell off my doorstep. You're a demon. What does he do? Flee. I would say the word flee. What does that mean? It means get out of there. That, that, that these things, these idols, this, this sensuality, this seduction, this, this thing, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a roaring lion. It's not a lion. There's only one true lion, the lion of Judah. It's like, it's, it's, an, it's an imposter lion. It, it, it's like, so flee, right? Like get away, like be sober-minded. Why? The enemy is like <laughs> a ravenous, very, very skinny skinny lion wannabe, by the way. Why? Because it hasn't eaten anything in a long time. <laughs> On the outside, it looks so like, look at my eyes. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so it right now. But, but on the inside, it's a, it's a lethargic <laughs> demon. It's a demon. I'm glad I got that point across. All right. And he says, he says, like, flee from it, right? Like, get away from it, right? Like, Get it off your phone. Get it off your computer. Get it out of your house. Right? Like, you know, it's funny. Like, like, like Jesus said, if it causes you to sin, cut it off. I don't know about you. I don't want to be cutting off any body parts. Let me say this. It's a lot easier to, de to, to delete an app than it is to go cutting something off that's, that God created to be part of you. 
I'm sorry, get a little practical. All right, how, how many of you know Dave Ramsey? Okay. I love Dave Ramsey. Little plug for Dave Ramsey. If you're in financial debt, I will not be dominated by anything. Visa, you will not be a master over me in 2021. American Express, you will not be a, you will not be my, a pharaoh over me. I will not be dominated by anything, and that includes debt. What? Okay, hold on. Why? Because debt is a demon. All right, good. All right. All, right. All right, so Dave Ramsey, he's got this video. Like, how do you get out of debt? And it, have, you, have you seen this? And he's got the gazelle, like this antelope thing. And, it, and it's running from like a cheetah, like the world's fastest animal, right? Cheetah. And this cheetah is just like, it's like, I'm going to eat. Like, I am going to have you for lunch. And like the cheetah's just booking it, man. Just like cheetahs do. Cheetahs, like, they, they book it. They're just like, like, like just, cheetah, the body doesn't move. The body's like a 740, the body's like a bomber, just flying through the air. <sighs> Ravenous, only the feet move. <sighs> but here is this gazelle, and the gazelle's just like, you know, the gazelle, the body is, is so graceful and so quick. But you know inside that gazelle's mind, it's freaking out, man. Like, you know that gazelle, inside its little gazelle brain, it's just like, it like, like, the, like, gazelle body's like, gazelle body goes like 30 feet in the air and lands. But inside, that gazelle brain is just like, Sing. Sing. And then you got Cheetah that's just like, Cheetah's just like, I will eat you. And Gazelle's like, ah! This is, what, this, is, this is what we do with idols. This is what we do with that spirit of, of lust. This is what we do with that spirit of adultery. This is what we do with that, with that spirit of greed. This is what we do with that spirit of murder. This is what we do with the spirit of divorce. This is what we do with the spirit of abortion. We get away from it. We get away from it. Lust, you don't get me today. Murder, you don't get me today. Satan, you don't get me today. And this is what Dave Ramsey says. He says, you treat debt, he doesn't say it like a demon, he needs to attend my class online, but this is like, he's like, you treat debt that way, you get away from it. You get away from it. And, this, and, and, and Dave got this from Paul. Flee from sexual immorality. The Bible is what defines immorality. The Word of God is what defines immorality. Why? Because in school, they don't have a concept for immorality. If it feels good, do it. If it's natural, do it. Whatever you want to identify with, you just identify. And by the way, uh, just in case you're curious, I identify as a male, as a man. Why? Because of the science. Because of the way that God created me. That Carolyn Leaf would say that it, would, it, would, it, would, it brings cognitive dissonance to enforce a lie over yourself. But if you continue to believe something long enough, if you can have your third grade teacher tell you that maybe you're not a little boy, if you can have uh, uh, whatever the culture telling you maybe you're not a little girl, maybe there's something, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just fine when you can be counseled, even to the degree of parents, pastors, anyone in authority being told that we are legally not allowed to provide any sort of counsel that would allow a child to rethink their decision to change their gender, knowing that counselors and pastors can go to jail, even prison, for counseling a young child that's about to make a life-changing decision, then we've got a major, major problem. And I will, and I have counseled those little boys. I have, I have counseled even those adults. And I've had the post-conversation as well, where the surgery was already done. Why? Because people felt like they did not have hope. 
They believed a lie. And guess what? Jesus saved them. Yeah. We've had some tricky conversations as elders. Is it okay if somebody had a gender surgery before they met Jesus and now they know Jesus and they want to become a member here at Sierra Bible Center? These are, these are very tricky conversations. And they're conversations that we need to be having. This whole thing regarding sexuality is something that we, we need to be having. Because if you're not talking to your kids, somebody else is. This is what he says. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Whom you have from God, you're not your own. Next time you hear somebody say, it's my body. Correct them. No, it ain't. It's my body. I do what I want. Mm, no, it's not. It's not your body. Why? Your body is his body. Your body is his body. It's been purchased. When Jesus died on the cross, did he die on a cross just for, just for believers? Or did he die for all of humanity? Don't do that to your body. Why? That ain't your body. That's his body. How are you stewarding your body? Remember the, the parable of the talents? You're given something, and then these guys, I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to bury it. It didn't go very well for them. You want to know the most incredible gift that you've been given? Your body. Your body makes consciousness possible. In fact, your body is just a device to keep your consciousness alive and active. No body, no present consciousness, not here anyway. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Glorify God. Glorify God with your body by not lifting up your soul to any idol. By not giving of your mind, your will, your emotions. By not allowing anything ungodly to enter into your mind. You see, this is the thing. <laughs> Sometimes religious ones or legalists, which we all turn into legalists when we want to use our religion to kind of work for us a little bit. So when we have relationship with Jesus, we're just like, God, if you said it, I believe it. I just want to be near to you. But when we're religious, we're like, was that really a sin? Did God really say? That's when we get religious. See, a lot of us think that as long as it's in the mind, it's not a sin. But if we act out with our body, then it becomes a sin. The only thing is, your mind doesn't know the difference. Like, for a man, when a man goes into a place of fantasy, and it's, what does that look like? Uh, right? <laughs> when a man goes into this place in his mind, his body begins to respond to his mind. Why? The body doesn't know the difference. The mind doesn't know the difference. How many of you have ever prayed in your mind but you didn't pray out loud. Was your prayer real? How many of you have ever spoken in tongues without speaking? I'll show you what that sounds like. <laughs> well, if you're not speaking, where is it taking place? Is it real? That's why Jesus said, some of you say that you're pure because you haven't committed adultery. But I say that if you've had lust in your heart, you've already done the act. Why? Jesus didn't separate the mind from the body. Well, this has been fun. All right. Just declare my body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. I belong to you, Jesus. You bought me with a price, so I'm going to glorify you with my body. How many of that's your desire? You want, to just, you want to glorify Jesus with your body, with your will, with your soul, with your spirit. 
I'm going to land this thing, okay? It's going to be good. Well, I'm going I'm to lead you through a prayer. We're just going to get every kind of soul hook out, like, because there's been a battle for our soul, which is why you see somebody on Facebook and, and, and you're just like, maybe your heart starts to, oh, yeah, those feelings, those feelings. I wonder what they're up to. I wonder what they're up to. Or you see somebody on Facebook and you're like, oh, bad words come out. I, I wouldn't know what those words are. I'm a pastor. But, like, you just... You see someone's face and you're just like either reattached to them, that old, that old flame coming alive, or you see someone's face on Facebook and, and your heart's filled with murder. Why? You're still tied to them. Soul, soul ties are with people. Soul attachments are with places and things, objects. Maybe you have items in your home and they were given to you by an ex-lover. There's a soul attachment there. When you see the item, it reminds you of your ex-lover. I remember I I was going to marry a a couple, and and the the wife had passed away, and I was doing uh, premarital counseling with them. And I said, the first thing we're going to get rid of is the mattress. Why? Soul attachment with the mattress. It's time to get a new mattress. You're marrying a new bride. So you have soul ties with other people's souls, Soul attachments with items that reconnect you. What about if you were part of a cult and there was a soul attachment with a group of people? What what if you were a part of an intercessory group that was pretty much a cult? (laughs) Okay, skip that one. All right. Um, (laughs) Just saying. I mean, I don't know. Um, What about churches? How many of you... You, you're, you were from a church, your, your heart was attached there, you gave of your, you have your time, your money, your energy, your sweat, and your blood, and then they did you like that. You know what I'm saying? And now whenever you see them pop up on like a Facebook ad, you're just like, oh. <laughs> Not that you can strangle a Facebook ad, but you do it in your soul. Why? There's still a soul attachment with that church. Declare with me, I, I will, will not, not be dominated, dominated by anything. Okay. So we're going to pray a prayer, and Holy Spirit's going to do all the work. I don't have to do anything. I've done my part, okay? But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray through some prayers, and it's going to be really good. Before we do that, I'll, I'm not going to ask you a question because everybody got it wrong in the first service. All right, so... The thing that's more important than your healing is learning how to protect your healing. Why? Because if you don't know how to protect your healing, you'll get healed of the back problem, legit healed. You'll be at church, you're like, I can touch my toes, which I can't do right now. I can touch my toes and there's no pain. Then you go home, you wake up the next morning and there's pain there. Pastor Darren, I lost my healing. No, no, you, you didn't. What you're having is a symptom Okay? And the enemy is using a symptom to get you to believe the lie that God did not really heal you. What do you do if you wake up with back pain the next day? You say, back pain? You're a demon? You are not. From- Darren, it's like you're from the 80s. Everything's a demon. Everything is a demon. It's all spiritual. It's all supernatural. That's why I talk about whatever I want on my Supernaturals podcast show. Why? It's all stinking Supernatural. I can get to put things in a little box, like that's natural, that's Christian music, that's secular. It's all spiritual. It's all stinking spiritual. Yep. So my point is this: you're gonna get set free today. That's great. What's more important than getting set free? How are you gonna protect your freedom? Which means that, listen, it's not unchristian to block somebody, even if it's temporarily, to block somebody on Instagram, to unfriend somebody on Facebook. Listen, you're not rejecting them. You're protecting your heart. You hear that little voice like, you hear that little voice like, oh, they're not going to, they're going to think that that's a demon. (laughs) Protect. Listen, if you clean the house, but you don't fill it, you don't protect the house. Listen, I'm not going to give you a beautiful diamond if you don't have locks on your doors. 
so we're going to get set free of some stuff, but I wanted to do that little thing that I just did. Why? Because I want you to protect your freedom. I want you to care more about your freedom than I do. I need you to protect yourself. I need you to say, that's where I was, Egypt. I ain't going back there. It's anti-life. It's anti-creativity. It's anti-abundance. And I am going to be for life and flourishing and abundance, transparency, walking in the light. We're going to have to be humble. We're going to have to be honest. And we're going to have to take our lives seriously and our choices seriously. Bringing our stuff before the Lord, allowing for his blood to cover us, to cleanse us, to wash us and forgive us of all of our sins, to believe his word, this is who I am now. The enemy will come and say, ah, that's not who you are. They say, it's who I am now. This is who I am in Christ. Is that good? After we pray together, if you are in bondage, okay, meaning you're just being tormented, if you say, I will not be dominated by anything, but you say, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm dominated by everything. Praise the Lord. You're at a safe place. We love you so stinking much. You're so stinking gorgeous. You're not the problem. The demon is the problem. I believe in angels. I'm not sure what I think about demons. Yeah, they're real. What do we do with them? How many of those do you have? We'll just get them all out. You don't get to pee on my stuff. You don't get to chew up my stuff. No, we're going to get them all out. So if you're being dominated by anything, you come up. My, our team, they're filled with fire. They're going to lay hands on you. Probably already filled up the slots for tomorrow, right? I'm not sure. D did we? We're doing, we're doing deliverance ministry tomorrow, but I think we've already filled up all the sessions from the first service. We will clarify that. But we'll do it today. Is that good? And if you're in bondage, don't leave until you're free. Not, dreams, sexual dreams, fantasies, going different, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you're like, you don't have any control of it. It's just where your mind goes and just like, let's get that dealt with. Yeah, let's get that dealt with. That's just the way I am. No, it's not. I was born that way. Maybe, maybe. Get all that generational stuff. You get free of not just your stuff. You get free of grandpappy's stuff too. How you, if you don't kill the, the giants in your life, they're going to be waiting for your children. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. You uncircumcised Philistine, you going down back to the pit of hell where you came from. You think you big, you think you bad, you ain't nothing. You a dog. You a dog. Let's pray. If you got your phones, take them out. Uh, you'll have a little camera on it. Um, hold up your camera. This is going to give you a prayer for breaking soul ties. Um, uh, I want you to practice this at home. Try this at home. Even when you're uh, uh, doing ministry with friends and family and you're running up against blockages and stuff, you can, you can pray this prayer with them. Uh, Pastor Anthony and I had a wonderful time of prayer with a lady that was being tormented by, uh, by demons and things that were projecting themselves into her room. It, was, it got real crazy. Um, and she could not get free, prayed for by the best. Um, uh, we, we prayed this prayer. We broke soul ties with um, spiritual uh, entities, um, uh, spirit tutors. When we prayed this prayer, she said, I'm set free. She left the room saying, I'm free, I'm free, because the, the pressure on her heart left, and then the demonic sensations in her feet left immediately. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. So... Um, Try this stuff at home, okay? Try it at work. All right, let's stand. Chris, if you want to come. Shikabamba. Go ahead and stretch out. You've been sitting a long time. You guys have been so patient. 
You're like, he's talking about what right now? Hey, just go ahead and hold out your hands. and Holy Spirit, we love you. <laughs> we give you so much thanks and praise for what you're doing at Seattle Revival Center, what you're doing in our families, what you're doing in our marriages. We honor your presence. We come before you not begging. We come before you as sons and daughters. We come before you boldly. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. So we come humbly asking. Holy Spirit, just reveal. Reveal so you can heal. We just want to be humble. We want to be honest. We've offered up our souls to idols. We've offered up our souls to things that were false. Given ourselves to worldly programming and worldly lies. Those beliefs became behaviors. We repent for any beliefs that we've had. We repent for any sort of behaviors that we've had. We repent of sexual sin, unwise choices. We repent for the sin of prostitution, not in our, just in our lives, but even in our family line, going back four generations right now in Jesus' name. Father, come with your blood and wash the record of our family line. Thank you, Lord. I'll share with you something really quick. Just, just keep your eyes shut. I know I'm talking to you, but the Lord spoke to me recently. He said, your future will look nothing like your past. That means that he is so radically changing us in every possible way that people won't even recognize you because you're so fundamentally different. You're so fundamentally restored. Just declare that my future will look nothing like my past. You know what that means? That means that you can't tell people, you don't know me. You can't say it anymore. Why? Because you don't know you. You are transforming at such a speed that right when you think you know who you are, you'll already be changed and different. Let's pray. Just say, thank you, Lord, for revealing to me this block in our relationship. Hold on, I skipped a step. I'm still kind of an amateur. Why don't you just ask Holy Spirit just to reveal any sort of soul ties or attachments right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Any sort of blockages in, in your soul? Anything that's hindering life? Anything that's hindering relationship? Holy Spirit, reveal. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Spirit. All right, everybody got something? Good. Now let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for revealing to me this block in our relationship. Father God, I repent for allowing this unhealthy soul tie. Now listen, if, if, if there's been behaviors that have been the fruit of these soul ties, just go ahead and repent for any behaviors that have been the fruit of this soul tie. I'll just give you a quick second. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together. I repent for the sin of idolatry, of allowing this relationship to become a hindrance in my life with you. I forgive. Now, why don't you still go ahead and forgive right now that thing that you were tied to, that person that you were tied to. For their part in making and strengthening this unhealthy soul tie. 
And in just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a pray, prayer. And every time I say break, I want you to take your hands and symbolically, I want you to clap your hands just symbolically of a chain being broken, okay? Jesus, I ask that you would break this soul tie. I renounce every unholy part of this bond right now. Jesus, I ask that you would break any hold that the demonic has had in this soul tie and send them to the feet of the Lord Jesus. I call back every emotion. I call back every thought. I call back every part of my will that was given to now just, that, just name it out loud, that thing or person that you gave your, your soul, your will to. Good. And I give back every emotion. Good. I give back every thought. I give back, hallelujah, every part of the will that was imparted. Just release it right now. Just give it back right now. Right now, right now, right now. Thank you, Jesus. For your healing, just put your hand on your head right now. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing of my mind. Yeah, good, 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 good. Healing to my will. Awesome, thank you, Lord. And healing to my emotions. Yeah, it's good. Receive it right now. It's just declare, I receive. The wholeness that you bring. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus some praise this morning. Hallelujah. You're like, is that it? Yeah, that's it. That seemed too easy. Yeah. He did it on the cross. You were set free 2,000 years ago. You come into agreement with the truth, and the truth will set you free. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Your freedom is already done. We begin with truth, and the truth leads us into all freedom. Can our pastors, elders, our ministry team come? Again, just my pastor heart, just pleading with you. Any sort of bondage, don't leave here in bondage. Leave here set free. You are loved. You are valuable. You are worth fighting for. You are worth protecting. Do you believe that? Even if you don't, I declare it over you. You are worth fighting for. You are valuable. You are worth protecting. Is that good? I love you so much. God bless you.